All right. Um, we are continuing with the second part of micromechanics and homogenization. So I summarized the idea. So essentially, you have a heterogeneous medium, and you're trying to simplify the macroscopic analysis of that of a structure that is made up of such a heterogeneous material. And the problem is the direct solution of the original problem is very hard because numerically, for instance, you'd, find you'd need a very fine uh, grid, which would be super costly. So instead, what we want to do is we want to approach the problem as we approach any other engineering problem. Uh, we have a material at hand. Of course, it has a microstructure. So what do we do in real life? We do an experiment. We characterize the material behavior. It's often approximate characterization in the sense that there is some modeling involved. We try to fit some curve to a data, etc. So for sure, there is some modeling error. Uh, but eventually, we use that model to solve this macroscopic problem that we're interested in. So presently, the idea is, is, is exactly the same. But we're going to do that in a theoretical numerical setting. And we call that uh, computational homogenization. And the idea was to solve. So let me summarize instead of writing the exact uh, form of the problem. So let me say solve for x of t um, so that, or let me say from, um, divergence of the stress field is equal to zero. So I told you that I am omitting body forces, which could be incorporated uh, uh, to, into the problem um, relatively easily. And accelerations are a bit tricky, but mild acceler accelerations also don't cause a problem. So in that case, I don't have to worry about um, uh, those terms. And eventually, uh, this is the problem. But the thing is, what we need to do is we need to somehow make a kinematic link between the microscopic and the macroscopic scales. In other words, I want to say, OK, if on the macro scale I have this type of deformation, this is the material behavior. So within my testing procedure in a theoretical setting, I need to somehow transfer that information onto the sample, which we called the RVE represents the volume element. So in real life, that would be an actual test specimen. So in this case, we have a volume that contains a sample from this heterogeneous material. We need to somehow project that macroscopic kinematic uh, information onto the sample. And the, we, they, we, the way we do that is to say that we're going to solve for a problem such that the average deformation gradient is equal to whatever we are trying to impose. Okay? Because we're trying to find the stress that corresponds to this input. And so we need to somehow make a link. And this is the microscopic information. We're saying that its average, although it fluctuates over the RV, its average over the RV is equal to precisely what we're trying to impose. And that we call the F-bar condition. Um, OK, and then uh, the purpose is to find the corresponding stress. And the stress is, uh, of course, eventually, once we solve for the problem, it's going to be highly oscillatory. In other words, for a given deformation, I also need to know which point I'm at within the RV, because from point to point, the microscopic constitutive formulation that I'm using, the material model, uh, can actually be different. And eventually, so this is our microscopic problem. Um, this is our microscopic equilibrium, F-bar condition, and the stress field that we are trying to solve for. And eventually, we said, well, the idea is the microscopic field also oscillates, but I want to find the stress corresponding to this deformation on the macro scale. And the way I'm going to define the stress on the macro scale is also going to be the mean of the microscopic field. Mean, again, referring to the volume average. So that was the idea. We want to somehow do a test. And the tricky part was to eventually, the last part that was remaining was how to impose this F-bar condition. Okay, So this is what we want to discuss a little bit today. And we defined, uh, for this purpose, two fields. First, I defined an oscillatory uh, field, x tilde, and an oscillatory field, p tilde in this manner. Okay. Um, and from this, we argued that average of p tilde, the stress from which this traction comes when you operate with the stress on the normal, must be equal to the average of the stress field 
minus the macroscopic stress field. Now, our definition is that p bar is equal to average p, and therefore this is equal to zero by definition. However, if we proceed in this manner and say that we have an x tilde over del capital x, I take the gradient of both sides, and I'm sorry, that's supposed to be f bar. Uh, that's now the right hand side is f minus f bar, and then I average this out, calling this f tilde. We said, well, average of f tilde is average of f minus f bar. Now, this is equal to zero, provided we are able to enforce this constraint, the f bar condition. That is our idea, right? But if we do a mistake with that, uh, with that procedure, this may not hold, and hence this may not be equal to zero. So in other words, satisfying the f bar condition is equivalent to saying that this thing is zero. Okay, and that's what I'm going to employ in my proof very shortly. All right. And now that is now what we're going to proceed with uh, as our first step in this lecture. I want to show you how you can ensure that average of f tilde is equal to zero. All right. Um, so um, now there isn't one way. Right? So let me remind you again, in all of these special topics, I'm choosing our path through the topic so that it gives us the, let me say, it allows us to experience the major steps and gives us an idea of how uh, continuum mechanics plays a role within all these operations, right? So in most cases, I'm just giving you like milestones, some major ideas, right? So to satisfy the F-bar condition, there can be multiple methods. I'm just going to summarize Three. So I'm going to say pick among three conditions. Okay. Or three possibilities. Okay. Um, now let me see if I can fit everything onto one board because it has two parts. One, first I will state how we or the procedure for satisfying the f-bar condition. And two, I will prove that they indeed do satisfy the f-bar condition. So first the procedure and then the, um, the proof, right? And now the f-bar condition, satisfaction of the f-bar condition is essentially going to be done by defining suitable boundary conditions for the theoretical problem on our RV. Because eventually, whenever you want to solve a boundary value problem, you need to have appropriate boundary conditions. And we've discussed that for the first time a little bit in the context of this topic on the uh, original heterogeneous and homogenized problems. So we know what type of boundary conditions there could be. But there are special boundary conditions for this um, homogenization procedure. And they need to be such that the safe part condition is satisfied. So let me summarize three. So the first one is the, what I'm going to call the Taylor Voigt, and I'm going to abbreviate that as TV, okay? And very soon you will recognize that this is identical to the Cauchy-Born hypothesis that we followed in the atomic to continuum scale transition. So remember, presently we have a very narrow focus. We're doing continuum to continuum scale transition, where on the micro scale we have a solid, on the macro scale we also have a solid. But usually the procedure is very, very similar for other types of microscopic models like fluid solid mixtures, etc. And in fact, the boundary conditions even these types of conditions that I'm discussing are also mostly applicable to the, those different uh, settings where the microscopic continuum is not as solid but something else. All right? um, so the first one is Taylor Voigt. And Taylor Voigt some says, that, says something super simple. It says that this oscillatory field that you pick, that we defined, right, that I just summarized, x tilde, which is x minus f bar capital X, in other words, the difference between the actual position and position predicted by uniform displacement, right? This is position predicted by uniform displacement, such as in Cauchy-Born hypothesis. X tilde is equal to zero everywhere, okay? Okay, so that's equivalent to saying that F is equal to F bar in
in the RV. Now, that's very nice, right? right. Um, so that means I do not need to solve for f throughout the sample. You know, I don't need to solve any equilibrium condition, right? I don't need to solve, the, I don't need to satisfy divergence of P is equal to zero. So why? Because I know that the microscopic stress, since F is equal to F bar from that condition at every point in RV, then if I want to know the stress at any point, it's simply P evaluated at F bar. There is also X in there, I just dropped it because it depends on the phase I'm in. Um, and then, my purpose was to find the macroscopic stress, which is the average of the microscopic one, which is now the microscopic stress at every point evaluated at F bar, volume averaged. And that's it, right? Super simple. So here, there is no need to satisfy equilibrium. Now, of course, we're not happy with that entirely. In other words, this is a cheap, but strictly speaking, wrong type of way to impose the F-bar condition because I need to have equilibrium always so that the material behavior is correctly predicted, right? Um, or that I have the correct solution, of course, to the problem from which I can extract some meaningful information. So this information is incorrect because F is not the local deformation that satisfies local equilibrium point-wise, right? So, but it's very cheap. It's very cheap. And we've already seen the advantage of such an assumption in the context of Cauchy-Born hypothesis without doing any fancy molecular dynamics as the microstructure deforms. Given a crystal structure that's already in equilibrium, I was able to calculate the macroscopic elasticity tensor, right? And we did all of that analytically. We got a closed form expression. So all of those advantages are translated into this present continuum to continuum scale transition as well under the context of taylor foyt assumption. This simple, cheap idea will allow us to make some analytical or even computationally very, very efficient uh, transitions or links between the two scales, but it's not the best one. So what I'd like to do is um, do something better. So this is a very strong constraint and the disadvantage is not satisfying the equilibrium. I like to relax the constraint, and I'm talking about relaxing the constraint in the following manner. I have my RVE, right? And there are particles, whatever, some types of heterogeneity is in it, heterogeneity is in it, and after it deforms, it picks a new configuration, V. And that configuration, because I have heterogeneities all over the place, will be such that the field, right, if I had drawn here a grid as well, the field and that grid is highly curvy, right? Highly oscillatory. So this is reality, this is what I expect. Now, with this one, what I'm doing is, right? What I'm saying is x is equal to f bar x, which means every grid line here that I see and on the boundary, they remain as lines afterwards, right? So what this says is, my deformation of the RV looks like this, inside and on the boundary. And because the lines are not allowed to deform according to the realistic picture, you don't satisfy equilibrium, etc. So let me do something better. What I will do is I will still constrain X tilde or X to obey this condition or X tilde to vanish, but only on the boundary. And I will let the internal points relax, okay? So in other words, I will suggest a second type of boundary condition that satisfies eventually, I'm, about, I'm also going to show that these do satisfy the F-bar condition, but I'm going to now propose a so-called linear displacement boundary condition. I'm going to abbreviate that as LD. A linear displacement boundary condition says X tilde is equal to zero again, but not everywhere in the RVE, 
but only on the boundary of your RV, your test sample. Okay? And that is equivalent to saying that X is equal to F bar capital X only on the boundary. Okay, alternatively, you can work in terms of the displacement. You can say that the displacement is equal to F bar minus identity would be H bar, the macroscopic displacement gradient. So U is equal to H bar X on the RV. And that's where linear displacement boundary condition name comes from, right? The displacement on the boundary is linearly prescribed through a constant tensor and the position of the boundary point, okay? Um, so now, well, that's my condition, and then how do I find what the stress field is? Well, you solve for, you try to satisfy divergence P equals zero. So you try to find the deformation that satisfies equilibrium on the inside so that um, I have equilibrium satisfied. So I'm going to say solve for P is equal to P of F. Again, it depends on um, the position I'm at, P, this function, or this functional, uh, but I'm just omitting it for simplicity. And P bar is equal to average P again, of course. So solve for P from microscopic equilibrium. Okay. And what this one is going to do is it's going to take your RV and it's going to keep the deformation on the boundary as a line, okay, because it's uniform deformation, but on the inside, the grid that in initially was a straight line perhaps, and I'm just depicting it here roughly, um, it's allowed to reach equilibrium and therefore after deformation it will be curvy. Um, okay, so that's a second choice. Um, now this idea of keeping the boundary fixed but allowing the stress field to satisfy equilibrium is actually a concept that indirectly we referred to as we referred to before and now perhaps it will become more clear it's called internal relaxation okay so i'm i'm keeping i'm prescribing a condition on the boundary, but I'm letting the internal points satisfy point-wise divergence P equals zero. Okay, so I allow them to relax. But notice that the name is very carefully chosen. It's called internal relaxation. And the reason is that the realistic deformation of the RV is probably, so in other words, if you think of this as a piece of the material that is deformed and there is material all around it on the macro scale, they're heterogeneous all over the place and I'm just zooming onto a certain portion after deformation, everything is highly oscillatory. So this is probably the good picture, the realistic picture, whereas this is still approximate because the lines are straight. So there is still, in some sense, some constraint on the boundary. I am only allowing internal relaxation, whereas in the vicinity of the boundary, I'm holding those points constrained. Okay, so there is still some restriction in this idea. So now the third level, right, among our three choices that I'm summarizing, is to also relax that. In other words, we're going to see if we can also do relaxation on the boundary, not only internally. Okay, that's going to take us now to the third picture. But let me again make a link to the Cauchy-Born or the atomic to continuum scale transition. In that case, this is the condition we had invoked. And there was an experimental right, uh, idea or, or a comparison with some experiment where on a uh, silicon microstructure or a crystal uh, from the Cauchy-Born hypothesis using some potential, they predicted the material properties for cubic symmetry, right? And they found that, that it was far away from microscope or the experimental conditions. And then I said, I gave you some numbers. I said, well, if you allow internal relaxation, then those numbers approach, right? The experimental measure. So when I talk about internal relaxation, this is what you could possibly do, okay? This is one thing you can do. 
The thing I'm going to talk about next is something you can do even better. But there you allow for relaxation, meaning you allow those internal atoms or points to reach or satisfy local equilibrium. There it was described in terms of net force on an atom to vanish. Here it's described as divergence P equals zero. So there are different settings, the conditions look different, but it's equilibrium in the end, right? Um, okay, so therefore we can also expect that this is going to be far from experimental results if we d indeed do experimental tests on such a material. And this should be closer because you allow the material to reach equilibrium. And what I will now talk about should be even better because we will try to do relaxation on the boundary as well. And that takes us to what is called a periodic condition or periodic boundary conditions. All of these are boundary conditions, right? Well, <laughs> let me correct. This is more than a boundary conditions because, condition because you say everywhere what is going to happen, okay? And you don't need to solve any problem. The second one is a boundary condition, and this is as well, is a boundary condition. Now I'm going to abbreviate this as PR. And to um, explain how this works, I need to draw a picture of the RV once again. Let me do it with a different color. So this is my RV. That's V naught, okay. Now I'm going to um, decompose the boundary of the RV into two portions. So this is the whole boundary, del V naught, right? Let's also write that. This is del V naught. Um, there isn't, again, one way to do this, but I'm going to call, let's say, top and right portions V plus side of the boundary. And I'm going to call the left and bottom portions of the boundary the minus side of the boundary. So together, if you take their union, you will have your complete boundary, okay? And moreover, I am going to define points that are what we call periodically linked. So I'm going to pick a point on the plus side, and I'm going to find its counterpart on the minus side. This is the plus point, okay? This is the minus point. And I will indicate everything associated with those points when I talk about pairs as such. So for instance, here there will be an x plus and an x minus in terms of positions. There will be a p plus and a p minus in terms of tractions. And eventually there will also be, for instance, outward unit norms, n plus and n minus. And something we can immediately observe due to this particular geometry that I'm choosing, okay, we observe that n minus is minus n plus. I'm going to make use of that. Okay. So for any, any point on the plus side, I can always pick a point that is linked to it on the minus side. For that point, it would be that. For that point, it would be this. For that, that, etc. For the corners, you have to be a little bit careful, but again, you can do it. Okay? So these are periodically linked points. And I'm going to call this periodic linking. Okay. All right. So once we have generated this periodically linked pairs of points by decomposing our boundary, um, now I can state what the periodic boundary condition stands for. It will say that the oscillatory portion of the displacement or the deformation x tilde on the plus side is equal to the one on the minus side, okay? And the oscillatory portion of the traction on the plus side is equal to minus the oscillatory portion on the minus side, okay? So these together are called periodic boundary conditions, and one says that displacement satisfies periodicity, 
attraction satisfies anti-periodicity, anti coming from this minus sign, but together one just calls this the periodic boundary condition. Okay? And it's very, very typical in many problems of physics and engineering, uh, and it's very useful because it has uh, advantages. Okay? Now, once we have this condition, and it's a strange condition now, I'm not telling you exactly what X tilde is, and I'm not telling you exactly what P tilde is, but it turns out this problem does have a unique solution apart from some no, no rigid body rotation is allowed with this boundary condition, but if you translate your RVE, left, right, up, down, inside, outside, this condition is still satisfied. So you have to constrain rigid body translation when you numerically meant this procedure. But apart from that technicality, this problem will have a unique solution. It looks strange, but it does. Um, Okay, so, well, once I can solve for it, and that's what we're going to do, so, or that's what we need to do, I solve for the stress field once again, so I'm going to say again, from the equilibrium condition, and the macroscopic stress is again a volume average, and I'm done, okay? Now, as I said, you encounter this boundary condition very, very often because it is a, in some sense, a optimal condition, and this optimality and I need to write this here, has different interpretations. Okay, and we could spend a lot of time discussing uh, what these uh, interpretations are. But eventually I'd like to give you um, one interpretation in which case the periodic boundary condition gives you the exact microscopic stress field. Exact compared to linear displacement boundary condition. I told you that linear displacement boundary condition has a strong constraint on the boundary, okay? So we talked about, I said, well, can we do something better? Can we allow the boundary to relax as well? This allows the boundary to relax to the exact microscopic stress field under some conditions, and I'm going to talk about it in a few seconds. So, but before I do that, let me tell you what these conditions correspond to. What these conditions equivalently uh, say is the following, right? So the linear displacement boundary condition, if you look on the boundary, says that your RV is going to deform only on the boundary uniformly. Taylor Voigt says it deforms uniformly everywhere, but linear displacement says only on the boundary. Okay. Now, what the periodic boundary condition says is, on the other hand, so this is, if you like, F bar X, what the, linear, what the periodic boundary condition says is that this is not necessary. I will allow the boundary to relax as well. And let's say the boundary relaxed like this, okay? And therefore, this is now the actual displacement field that is predicted by the periodic boundary condition. Now here, you make a certain amount of, you allow a certain amount of fluctuation, x tilde. Remember, x tilde is the difference between x and f bar x. So it's not zero uh, because, uh, of, because of the fact that this is not equivalent to linear displacement boundary condition. But you allow this fluctuation in a very, very, sorry, special manner. It should be such that on the plus side, the fluctuation should be exactly equal to the one on the minus side. In other words, on the minus side, the picture looks like this. Now, therefore, if on the right side, again, I have such a fluctuation, and of course, this is a very, very simplified deformation, but it makes the point. If I have that deformation on the right side, on the left-hand side, the picture should be the same with respect to this mean or uniform deformation on the boundary, okay? But that's not all. What I'm also saying is that this, this periodic deformation is such that if you look at the stress field at this point, let's say on the plus side, P plus, this is equivalent to saying that the stress here, or the traction here, is exactly equal and opposite to the traction on the minus side. Okay? And what that would mean is that if you take this blue line translate it down here, and if you try to fit these two points together for equilibrium, you would need two things. One, kinematically, the boundaries of that picture and the one I translate down, and let me do it like this. Okay, so I would have the deformation of Right? 
So I translated this blue line down here, okay? So this deformation is there, continuing, okay? And the top line is indicated with dotted black line now, now. And because this blue line perfectly matches this blue line, when I translate it down, the dotted black line will perfectly match the blue line, right? The deformation is matching perfectly, but that's not necessary or sufficient for equilibrium. What I also need is the forces should cancel each other. And P tilde equals P minus guarantees that. Those pictures fit perfectly onto one another, right? Um, so that is the idea in periodic boundary condition, right? So that is just the condition we're talking about. I'm not saying that it's realistic, but it is allowing some type of relaxation of the boundary with respect to the mean field, which is described by the linear displacement boundary condition, okay? Um, all right, so now, um, for a given average f equals f bar, okay? Now we can actually argue uh, via energy minimization that there is a hierarchy in the quality, let me say, of these boundary conditions. And for this purpose, let me draw a simple, if you like, test where you impose f bar towards a measure p bar, right? And I'm just, if you like, talking about some uniaxial deformation, okay? So there's only one f bar that you're controlling and there's only one stress, for instance, the one corresponding to that direction, okay? And you measure the stress correspond to a given f bar, okay? So you impose the f bar either through Taylor void or linear displacement or periodic. These are different conditions, and therefore when you calculate the average stress and call it p bar, you will measure probably different stresses, right? Um, now, suppose Taylor void gives you this, right? Now, Taylor void does not allow any relaxation anywhere, right? So, uh, well, the actual solution we know from the problems of physics is usually corresponds to minimization of the energy. So the minimization of the energy, in this case, if you do a test in, even for a homogeneous material, the area under the curve is associated with energy, right? Um, so the solution is one that minimizes the total energy that is stored in your sample. Now, Taylor void does not allow any relaxation and therefore it does not really allow for any energy minimization at all. Linear displacement does, but only internally. But since it does allow in, um, some degree of relaxation, so it's going to give us probably a result that overall corresponds to less energy, so less e e area under the curve, right? So because it does allow the energy to be minimized. So this is LD. But this is only relaxation on the boundary. Now, periodic boundary condition also allows something to happen on the boundary as well, not only internally, also on the boundary. So when you deal with the periodic boundary condition, you expect now a curve that is even less steep because the area under the curve, the total energy should be even less because you're allowing for complete energy minimization, right? So if you do um, numerical tests where you impose the f-bar condition and measure the average p and you plot them from these different conditions, you, act, you, you um, measure these curves and we expect this one to be closer usually to the um, experimental measurements because you allow for relaxation. It turns out linear displacement, if you um, employ it correctly, will also work fine. In other words, under appropriate conditions, and that mostly has to do with how you choose your RV, in particular how large it is, how many particles, let's say, there's in it. These two curves may approach each other and in some limit where the RV is very, very large, um, they might overlap, but this black line is always a, let me say, a terrible choice, okay? But it has theoretical advantages. So I'm going to say that these two are, okay? And when I say these two, I refer to linear displacement and periodic. Both are practically useful if you know what you're doing.
Okay, so full constraint within the volume, constraint only on the boundary, and relaxation of the constraint also on the boundary. And now, why is periodic expected to work better in some cases? Well, because in some cases, in fact, the microstructure is periodic. Okay? Periodic means the following. You zoom into the microstructure, and what you see is a picture like this. Let's say there are particles, right? But those particles are very nicely distributed, so as if there is some crystal structure, right? So there is a white matrix, and I'm drawing these lines just as a guide, and this is exactly how the microstructure looks. And with modern production techniques, it is not hard to generate periodic microstructures at very fine scales over actually large, large volumes, right? So this is something today that is easily done. So when you have a periodic microstructure, you don't have to choose your RV to be very large. In fact, there is a very meaningful choice which corresponds to only a single repeating unit because this is now like the tile on your wall. You only pick one. And if you take this and put it to the left, top, right, on the corners, and if you keep doing that, you can generate your whole microstructure systematically. This is called a unit cell, okay? It's the single smallest um, unit that you can choose to generate your whole microstructure systematically. There isn't only one way to define a unit cell or to choose it geometrically, but I just chose one in this case, right? Um, okay, so now, this is now the reference configuration of the unit cell. And the tricky part is, now one argues that this is the reference configuration, so this is uh, V naught, okay? Or let me call it not V naught, just zoom into the microstructure in the vicinity of some macroscopic point. Now, after deformation, that's a bad one, okay? This is the current configuration now. Now, after deformation, if I look at this picture once again, because there is such a nice periodicity, it turns out the deformation field is also one that now I may not have drawn it very well. In fact, I didn't. But the idea is the deformation field is such that what you can do is, again, choose a unit cell, perhaps the one you chose before, and it has a certain deformation. And you take this picture translated left, right, top, down, corners, etc., and what you see is you obtain this blue picture. In other words, this thing has a deformation somehow that periodically generates the actual deformed microstructure. So its deformation is what we call periodic, and therefore the displacement should be periodic, and the tractions should be such that it satisfies equilibrium. In other words, when I translate it left and right, tractions should be equal and opposite. It's exactly the periodic boundary condition. So in other words, PR is exact for periodic microstructures. And in that case, it also numerically simplifies our problem because I don't have to deal with a very large computational sample, V naught. I can deal with a tiny one and obtain everything about deformation from the deformation or from the problem from the deformation of this unit cell and do volume averaging, obtain the macroscopic stress. So it, it has significant advantages. Now, is every problem periodic? No, it's not, but there are many problems which are periodic, and in that case, it's best to use periodic boundary conditions because it gives you the exact uh, solution. Okay. So it's fully relaxed, it's the minimum energy. Right? Good, so, um, 
Okay, so we're, we're proceeding a little bit rapidly, perhaps. Um, and I hope not too many things are vague, but I think now we have an idea about what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to do material testing and, uh, and in a computational setting, and I'm giving you some conditions with which we can satisfy the F-bar condition because that's the kinematic link between the micro and macro scales, and the stress is always defined as soon as you solve this problem, P-bar is obtained by post-processing the microscopic stress field. Okay? And we've discussed three conditions from which I have claimed that the F-bar condition is satisfied. Okay? So of course now I need to convince you that the F-bar condition is indeed satisfied, so I need to actually prove them. But the proof is very short, so let me do those. Okay. Um, all right. Um, now the proof. Or let's say, let's show. that for a given f bar, average of average f is equal to indeed that given f bar based on these con um, boundary conditions, okay? So for this purpose, sorry. Right? I'm going to employ the equivalent condition that average of f tilde should be equal to zero. And f tilde is, Okay, so let me write it here, F, average F tilde, that's equal to one over the size of the domain, integral over the RVE, del X tilde over del capital X, dV. Okay, okay so this is like, like X tilde I, capital X A, so that's x tilde i comma a, so I can use things that are, right, all those uh, differential, let me say, relations that allow us to make a transition from volume to boundary integrals and deduce immediately that, in fact, this is something we had written, uh, deduce immediately that this is equivalent to x tilde bond n. Okay. All right, nice. Okay, now the proofs, they immediately follow for the first two. For Taylor Foyt, x tilde is zero everywhere. In other words, f tilde is equal to zero. So I don't have to worry about it. It's immediately equal to, this, this thing is immediately satisfied. Now for a linear displacement, x tilde is not zero within the domain because you allow relaxation, but on the boundary, x tilde is equal to zero, okay? That was our definition, right? Uh, so in other words, just from the expansion of f tilde, right, explicit expression within the volume and through a boundary integral, uh, I immediately see that the first two are trivially satisfied. So the only thing I have to be careful about is the periodic case. But for the periodic case, it's also simple, simple because what I will do is I will decompose this term, let's call it star. Star is equal to integral over the boundary. Now I'm going to decompose the boundary into the plus and minus portion. So there is x tilde plus bond n plus dA plus there is the minus portion and together they constitute the complete boundary. But I've already told you that n minus is equal to minus n plus because of the construction of the periodically linked pairs and therefore this whole thing is equal to integral over del v naught plus x tilde plus minus x tilde minus bun n plus d capital A. And periodic boundary conditions say that the oscillatory displacement field is equal to zero. That's the condition. Okay. 
and therefore this integral is equal to zero, and therefore f tilde is also equal to zero. Average of f tilde is also equal to zero for periodic conditions. So f bar condition is also satisfied. Right? So that's the proof. That's quite straightforward. So I picked those three conditions or defined them because they are special, because they do indeed satisfy the F bar condition. And now we're done, essentially, with the basics. Um, so I understand what I mean by homogenization, right? I want to simplify the solution of this macroscopic problem by doing theoretical or computational tests in this case, uh, which are the counterparts of experimental tests. And you impose the macroscopic deformation somehow. And in this case, it corresponds to the F-bar condition. And you pick among the three, for instance, that I've described. Um, and each one, in some sense, has its advantages. But periodic is optimal in most cases. And then you solve for the microscopic stress field. You average it. You obtain your macroscopic stress. And then remember, I do modeling. I fit some curve to my data and use that for the solution of the macroscopic problem on a very coarse grid. So the problem is now much easier to solve. That's the goal, right? Uh, but you do all of this, and then you wonder, well, is it possible that I'm messing up somewhere, right? Because it's easy to make a mistake. And I already gave you one example. For instance, I told you that, well, we are defining the um, macroscopic, fundamental macroscopic stress and strain, or kinematic and kinetic measures to be volume averages. So f bar is average of f, and p bar is equal to average of p. But this is not true for every case. So for instance, e bar, I told you, is not equal to emphatically, right? It's not equal to average of b, e, or S bar is not equal to average of S. So if you're not careful, you can introduce some inconsistencies into your procedure. When you need S bar, you might volume average your microscopic S field, and you say that's S bar. And then at some point else, you might need P bar, and you might say P bar is equal to average of P. You might also use that. But then remember, for continuum mechanics to hold on the macro scale, Fs needs to be equal to p, right? And if you define this like that and that like that, you put everything together, it won't work. Because the right condition is you have to use this macroscopic relation to actually define what s bar is. And s bar is therefore defined as f bar inverse um, p bar, OK? Um, so this is the type of thing I'm, t I'm, I'm talking about where you need to be careful. You need to, be, you need to make sure that you are not violating some, uh, let me say, consistency relation with respect to the behavior or definition you expect in the context of continuum mechanics. Now, in the context of what we have done, there is one or there are two particular things that we need to also proceed and show. One is the following. I have defined the macroscopic stress field in terms of the first Piola Kirchhoff stress tensor. But now, OK, I'm talking about satisfying the equilibrium. Am I satisfying, so that is linear momentum balance, how about angular momentum balance? Because we remember that for angular momentum balance in referential form, PF transpose should be symmetric. Okay? Or in other words, S bar should be symmetric. Okay? That's equivalent to that. So, I need to make sure that that's also satisfied. And let's go ahead and show that. And something else I'm going to show is that's the second part. Uh, well, we could also argue everything energetically. And that's what, exactly what, how we had proceeded in the context of atomic to continuum scale transition. I said, well, the micros macroscopic ener energy is volume average of its microscopic counterpart. Because when I simplify the problem, by smearing out the microscopic details and making a transition to some macroscopic simpler problem, whatever energy I had before should be whatever energy in my simplified problem, because then I unnecessarily generate energy or dissipate energy. So I need to make sure that when I do my procedure, my computational homogenization, I preserve energy. 
And that's the second thing that I need to verify. And it turns out, somehow, mathematically, those two conditions are linked to one another. Angular momentum balance and energy, you wouldn't know, right? But uh, mathematically, in this context, they are very closely related. So let me show that. So what I'd like to talk about is, as I said, let's check for at least some. And I'm going to call them microscopic, macroscopic uh, consistency conditions. And just let me abbreviate it as micro, macro consistency conditions. And I already gave you one example in terms of the definition of the stress. Okay. Um, so, um, First, we make an observation, a identity that we're going to make use of. And that's going to take us to macroscopic angular momentum balance. So I'm going to look at the average of PF transpose. So that's a tensor that I'm familiar with. It is the Kirchhoff stress tensor, or it's the Jacobian times the Cauchy stress tensor. I called it tau earlier. Now remember, Jacobian times, right, um, times the Cauchy stress tensor, that's this, and this is symmetric because of angular momentum balance. So this is symmetric. So average of tau, since tau is symmetric, average of tau is also symmetric, hopefully, right? But let's see if that's going to work out, okay? Um, so, or it is indeed symmetric, but let's see what's, what, where that is going to take us to. So I'm going to decompose every field into its mean and fluctuating part. part as I had done once before uh, in the context of turbulence, right? Um, so I'm going to say average of F, F tilde, average of P, P tilde, and I volume average that. And I get multiple terms. First of all, average P and average F, they are already constant, so they come out as they are. Sorry, I forgot the transpose, okay? And transpose is a linear operation. I take it outside of the integral. Um, so then, um, I have terms like average P tilde multiplying average F. Average F is a constant. All I have is average P tilde multiplying average F transpose, but average P tilde is zero. That term would be zero. And then, average P multiplying average F tilde is also going to be zero because average F tilde is equal to zero. So there's only one more term. So I'm skipping two terms and immediately writing this equality. That's a tilde, not a bar. OK. So, well, now I ask myself, average p is equal to p bar by my definition. And average f is equal to f bar. So this whole thing is average f bar transpose. And for continuum mechanics to make sense after I do all of this procedure, p bar f bar transpose should be what I call the macroscopic Cauchy stress tensor, right? So in other words, this thing better be symmetric, right? Do you see? I'm defining P bar to be a volume average and F bar to be a volume average, okay? And then, so P bar, F bar transpose is tau bar. I call that the Kirchhoff stress tensor on the macro scale. This is supposed to be symmetric, but after I do all of these averaging operations, perhaps it's violated because there are some other terms. And indeed, if you look here, the left-hand side is guaranteed to be symmetric. If this is symmetric, but there is such a term there, perhaps this is not symmetric and this is not symmetric, together they sum up to something that is symmetric. So in other words, as long as this term is, not, is here, so I cannot get rid of it, I cannot guarantee that this is symmetric. There is no proof for it. However, if I can show that this is equal to zero, left side is, side is symmetric by construction, so this must be symmetric, and that's equivalent to saying that macroscopic angular momentum balance is guaranteed. Otherwise, there is this term that messes up my argument. So I need to show that this is equal to zero. It would be nice if it were equal to zero. 
Okay? So my question is, is this symmetric? And that's what takes us to the question, right, or the observation that clearly tau bar is equal to average of tau um, holds, right? If average p tilde f bar tilde transpose is equal to zero. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I'm correcting one thing, right? So I made a mistake here. So this should be average of p tilde f tilde transpose. Otherwise, individual terms are of course zero. Oops. I'm sorry because that might have, you might have wondered why that term is not equal to zero. Indeed, it is equal to zero. This one is not. Okay, okay so t bar is equal to average, tau bar is equal to average tau if this term is equal to zero. That's what I've written here correctly. And this guarantees macroscopic um, angular momentum balance. And that is, for instance, a second example now, after the definition of stresses, um, a second example to um, what I called micro-macro consistency. In this case, for consistency of the macroscopic problem definition. All right, so I need to somehow um, deal with that term. So let me expand that term now. And I'm going to do something very simple to what I've done actually on the board that I'm erasing uh, for dealing with boundary conditions and showing that they satisfy the f-bar condition. I'm going to decompose that term or express it in terms of a boundary integral. So. Let's show the following. I'm looking at average of p tilde multiplying f tilde on the boundary, uh, within the volume, so dB. And I have my indices, so let's call them i, a, and j, a. Okay. And f tilde j a is nothing but x tilde j comma a. And if you like, put your pencils down for a second. And let's do this together, right? There is supposed to be a tilde there as well. All right, I'm trying to show that the average of p tilde f tilde transpose is equal to zero. So that entails evaluating this volume integral. So p tilde, okay, that's what it, whatever it is, and f tilde is x tilde j a, and now I'm going to express this term in a different manner. In particular, I'm going to do something that you have done numerous times in your homeworks. I'm going to express this as p tilde i a, x tilde j, comma a dv, but if I do that, I will get two terms. One of them is that term, and then there is another term, so I need to subtract that. That second term is integral over v naught, p tilde i a comma a x tilde j dv, okay? Now, um, remember that p tilde i a is the oscillatory stress field, right? And now we remember that divergence of the stress field is equal to zero on the micro scale, okay? Um, so if that is equal to zero, then it's equal to divergence of average p plus p tilde. That's also equal to zero because that's the mean plus the fluctuating part. But divergence of a constant is equal to zero, so that's equal to divergence of p tilde is equal to zero. 
And that's what it is. So this term is equal to zero by equilibrium. Okay? Now, we need to be careful. The taylor voigt assumption, a uniform deformation, does not satisfy equilibrium. But in this case, the, um, eventually it turns out we don't have to worry about um, or we can deal with that extra term and still somehow argue something that is meaningful. I'm going to uh, come back to that probably in a second. So it's equal to zero for equilibrium. Um, and we need to remember that we said there is no body force or acceleration. Okay? And so we have no additional terms there. Okay. All right, so I got rid of that term, and now I can look at this term, and this term together is, now I can express it as a boundary integral, integral over the boundary of the domain, P tilde I A, X tilde J N A. Okay, I'm going to put N A over here, X tilde J D A, okay? And P tilde N, the oscillatory stress operating on the normal is what we defined as the oscillatory portion of the traction, P tilde, okay? And therefore, if that second term indeed vanishes, what I have shown is that average of, right? So now if I scale by V naught as well, average of P tilde F tilde transpose is equal to one over the integral of, on the boundary of the RV, P tilde, Bon x tilde. Okay? Please write that much. So that's the identity that we are going to make use of. So let's focus on the goal. The goal is to show that this is equal to zero, and if that is equal to zero, I have argued that we guarantee that the definitions we have made ensure one micro-macro consistency, namely that with these definitions you ensure that macroscopic angular momentum balance is satisfied, all right? Um, and for that, right, this is what we are trying to show. And this is the transition that I made to simplify that discussion. So now we have a look, right? So first of all, the taylor foyt assumption, which says that x tilde is equal to zero everywhere. It does not satisfy equilibrium, but now if I look at these terms actually, so there is a problem because this term does not automatically vanish, but this equality is in fact still true because x tilde is equal to zero everywhere for a right, taylor foyt assumption. That is the condition. Deformation is uniform everywhere. So this term immediately dies out, also though this is not equal to zero. Uh, and then this remaining term likewise dies out because x tilde is equal to, again, zero everywhere and hence on the boundary as well. So um, this is trivial for taylor foyt Now for a linear displacement condition, you do satisfy equilibrium and therefore this term drops not because x tilde is, e is equal to zero but divergence of p is equal to zero. And then you're left with that boundary term and the linear displacement condition says that x tilde is zero not on the inside, but on the boundary, okay? So also for linear displacement, this is trivially uh, satisfied. So the thing that we have to worry about is the periodic one. And the periodic one is also simple because if I look at that term, star, okay? Star is equal to now again, I will decompose that integral into the plus and minus portions of the boundary. So I will have p tilde plus bun x tilde plus dA plus del v naught minus and on the minus side p tilde minus x tilde minus dA. And then we just recall now that tractions are anti-periodic, namely P tilde minus is equal to minus P tilde plus. And therefore I can write this as integral over only on the plus side, P tilde plus bun 
x tilde plus minus x tilde minus. x tilde plus minus x tilde minus. Okay. And now I invoke the periodicity of displacement. And that's also equal to zero. So by making use of anti-periodicity of the tractions and the periodicity of the displacement, I show that this integral as a whole is equal to zero. So star is again equal to zero. Okay. Okay, nice. So all of these conditions seem to work quite well. They deliver exactly what I need and what I expect. Okay. Um, so we've discussed the angular momentum balance. And now, finally, the last piece of the puzzle is everything consistent from an energetic perspective. So in other words, is the macroscopic energy also a volume average of its microscopic counterpart? That's certainly something I expect in this setting, because otherwise I would be unnecessarily uh, altering the overall energy of the system. Okay. So to do that, I'm going to now make use of the result that we have at this stage. So now we have ensured right, average PF transpose is equal to average of P and multiplying average F transpose. That's what we have shown. Average of the Kirchhoff stress is equal to the macroscopic Kirchhoff stress, and hence angular momentum balance. Um, I'm going to take the trace of both sides. Remember, trace of A, B transposes A dot B. That was the definition of a scalar product for two tensors. So we have. P dot F is equal to P dot F. Now, here's a tiny argument, and I expect you to fill in the blanks. You can look at the proof that I just made for that transition, and you will observe, if you're careful, that I did not assume that the stress field is somehow associated with this deformation gradient. So point-wise, P is not the stress that necessarily comes from the local deformation. This is just some stress field that is divergence-free, and this is just some deformation field, and hence it is the gradient of some position vector, right? But they are not necessarily related to each other. I made no such assumption. So in other words, this equality holds for a given stress field. It holds for some F distribution. Let's call it F1. It also holds for some other F distribution. Let's call it F2. And now I can take the difference of the two. And what I observe is there is an incremental change or perturbation to my F. And this relation still holds. Okay. And in particular, instead of talking about a change in F, I can talk about the rate of F. And now I can go back here and write, in fact, okay. And this is what I've argued and what you need to think about. This is equivalent to also saying that P dot F dot is equal to that. Okay. So now, I told you Fs don't need to be related to P. But of course, physically, we do expect that to happen. In other words, the deformation is changing with time, and therefore, stress is changing with time. At any given state, at any given time, there is a certain F distribution, and there is a corresponding stress distribution. Right? That's, of course, physically what we expect. But mathematically, I just wrote what is in blue to argue the transition from here to there. All right? uh, so now, that is an interesting expression that we are going to make use of. Uh, because what you see on the left-hand side is the volume average of the stress power 
Remember? P dot F dot, when we talked about uh, mechanics of soft materials, that's what we defined as the stress power, okay? And let's re re let me write this um, explicitly. So this is average um, microscopic stress power. And average P is P bar, the macroscopic stress. Average of F dot is F bar dot. In other words, the rate of the macroscopic deformation. So P bar dot F bar dot, that, that is macroscopic stress power. So what we see is that because of the deformation, or in order to induce local deformation of the material, you have to put in some work per unit time, that's your power, right? And the volume average of that power happens to correspond to exactly the power you need to sup supply to your homogenized description of the continuum. Because that's also the description, consistent description of the stress power from a continuum perspective. So we are preserving the stress power, okay? So that should allow us to also make sure that the volume average of the energy is also preserved, and that's what I'm going to show in a few lines. So there is an equality here which is critical. So this equality is so critical that it has a special name. This is called, in the context of homogenization, the Hill-Mandel condition. It is something that you better satisfy. And now let's get to the point about energy, okay? And let me write that with a different color. Now, let's say, do we ensure the macroscopic energy is a volume average? Okay. Um, and the answer is yes, and the proof is quite short once we have these relations on board. Well, for this, to be true, let me begin with the left-hand side, W bar. That's the macroscopic energy. If I want continuum mechanics to work on the macro scale as well, it better be the case that the average of the macroscopic energy with respect to the parameter which controls it kinematically, namely F bar, it better be equal to P bar because that's what I have on the micro scale, right? Okay, so from an energetic perspective, this is an expectation that I better have. And so then this rate becomes like this, okay? So this is my expectation. Um, so let me say necessary for macroscopic hyperelasticity. I'm saying hyperelasticity here because that's the only thing that we have uh, discussed. Okay, so I'll put that perhaps on, in quotes because even if you have inelastic behavior, the arguments will hold actually. Um, okay, well, uh, well, if now if I want to make a link to the right hand side, now I can plug in my definition. So if I can try to see. Um, if my definitions will take me or carry me over to this, to the right hand side of the equality, okay? So my definitions are that average P is equal to F bar, and this is equal to average of F dot, okay? So let's see what that does. What that does is now I have this result. And what I've just shown is that this is equal to this. Okay, so I can move from the right to the left. Okay, but P is, of course, microscopically, I better have this consistency satisfied. So this is equal to del W del F. And so this is equal to the average del W over del F. 
dot f dot, or it's equal to average of w dot. So the energy rate, and hence, the energy is preserved in scale transition. In fact, um, again, that's where we started from when we were discussing the atomic to continuum scale transition. And that requirement is so fundamental that we could have proceeded in exactly the opposite manner to which we have chosen to proceed with in, this, in these two lectures. So I could have said at the start, as I've done uh, in atomic to continuum scale transition, in this context as well, well, this is what we expect, and let's see where that takes us. Okay? And it turns out, first, it gives us or induces the Hill-Mandel condition. Right? And that's why it's so fundamental, so it has a name. Okay? Um, and then we could say, well, to satisfy that, what do I need? I need to have special boundary conditions, et cetera, et cetera. And in particular, all of these arguments will induce the definitions that the macroscopic stress should be this, macroscopic deformation should be that, and so on. Right? So, um, so the energetic point of view is very actually fundamental. But I've chosen a path that I think is a little bit more intuitive. I've discussed this from the point of view of material testing but in a theoretical, let me say, computational setting, right? Um, all right, so that is pretty much the overview of uh, another topic or application of continuum mechanics, continuum to continuum scale transition uh, in the context of micromechanics and um, homogenization, right? Um, so that was the sixth one, and I think by now we have a pretty good uh, picture of um, how continuum mechanics helps us how it allows us to solve um, a, a variety of problems, actually, right? And notice that here I'm consistently and pretty densely making use of also the mathematical framework that is uh, indispensable in the context of continuum mechanics, right? Um, it's mostly actually a vector calculus from our vector algebra from one point of view, but the thing is, with, in the context of mechanics, we have to also have these tensors, right? This is something that you don't always explicitly have to deal with in any field of engineering. But in this case, in the context of continuum mechanics, uh, that is one difficulty. That's where our mathematical tools allowed us to be familiar with all of these operations that I keep doing, for instance, on that board, right? Um, OK, so that's, that's, it's not only the, the, the concept itself, the concept of continuum, but also the mathematical tools that it comes with that helps us attack these problems. All right, questions? <laughs>